at what Jesus did. We look at what some of the disciples were doing. We look at Mary and Martha and their personalities and attitudes. We look at Lazarus and thank God he was resurrected. But I want us to look together at verse 16 and read that once more. John 11 verse 16 says, Then said Thomas, you know which Thomas that was? What is he usually accused of? Doubting. doubting. I think Thomas got a bad rap because I've doubted before and they don't call me doubting pastor. <laughs> Amen? Thomas doubted, but in this verse it says, Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. I want you to look at that word Didymus. Anybody remember what that means? Twin. Twain. Bible scholars tell us that Thomas had a twin. And I got to thinking about that as I read these verses this last week. We've got some twins in this church. I believe uh, Sister Kathy back there, she's got a fraternal twin. She's got a brother that doesn't look exactly like her. My wife's dad has a brother, and they're fraternal twins. You never know it by looking at them, but they grew together in the womb. They were born a minute apart. Tom and Jerry, that's their names. Can you believe that? <laughs> Tom and now they're not, it, it's not a cat and a mouse, nothing like that. But Tom and Jerry are fraternal twins. I got to thinking about Thomas's twin. We don't have any mention of that twin. We don't know if it was an identical twin, a brother, a fraternal twin that might have been a sister. But I got to thinking about the fact that Thomas was a twin and I started studying on the relationships that twins have. My best friends growing up in, uh, in life, Brent and Brett Matherly, they were identical twins. They could finish each other's sentences. They knew what the other one was thinking. They've got to have contact with each other all the time. They are best friends. But then I got to think about some of the stories I've heard through the years about twins who were separated at birth. And when they finally find each other, they dress just alike. They still look just alike. They, they enjoy the same food. They bought the same kind of house. Do you know what? I believe there are some twins in the body of Christ who need to be reunited. I got to thinking about Thomas. We have no mention of him being reunited with that twin. I read one book that said that Thomas's twin was Jesus. I don't know if I'd go that far, but somewhere Thomas had a twin. And I wonder if he went through all this ministry and all this time with Jesus, how much he thought of that twin and how much he would like to get back together with him or her. There are some twins in the spirit realm that we need to get back together. Sometimes twins look just alike. Sometimes twins don't look anything alike. I want us to look at some twins this morning. Five sets of twins that need to be reunited. Some of these look just alike and some of these are fraternal twins. They don't look anything alike. But I believe if we could get them back together, we could win the world for Christ. Number one, the first set of twins that need to be reunited, passion and power. We need to get passion and power back together in the church. Whether you realize it or not, passion and power are not distant cousins. They are actually twins. They might not look alike, but Doc, it takes one to go along with the other. If we're going to have power, we need to have passion. And I see it in the disciples. I see it in the lives that they lived. After Jesus was resurrected, I see Peter, who was a coward, and deny the Lord, stand up and preach one of the greatest sermons that had ever been preached. My prayer today is God let us as your children seek out these twins who have been separated for the last 40 years and get them back together. Do I want power in this church? Yes, I want power. I want to see the sick healed. I want to see the dead brought back to life. But I'll tell you what, as much as I want power in the church, I want a passion in the church. I want a bunch of people who are passionate about the Word of God, who are passionate about ministry, who are passionate about going into the highways and the byways. Oh, we want the power, but let's reunite power with passion. I see it in the disciples. Peter and John were going into the temple over in Acts chapter 3. And they came upon that lame man who was laying there and begging. And he looked at him as though he thought he might receive something. But Peter looked down on him on Acts 3 verse 6 and said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I'll tell you, it was the power of the resurrection that made that man walk, but it was the passion of a disciple to stop what he was doing. Say, let me tell you what. I don't have any money in my pocket right now, but what I do have, I'm going to give unto you. 
Oh, I wonder if that had been the church in 2016, would we just walk on by? Say, ain't that pitiful? I'm thankful we got people in this church who don't just walk on by. They've got the power to change lives and the passion to go with it. Doc, I thank you for what you're teaching our children as you go downtown on Sunday morning in the cold and in the rain and in the heat and you take time out of your life to give to those who are less fortunate. What we need in the church is a family reunion. We need to get passion and power hooked back up. There are money-hungry people who call themselves children of God. There are money-hungry and fame-hungry preachers who want it all for themselves. I tell you what, I don't want the power. I want God to possess the power. I want to have the passion that causes the power to flow once again. I believe it can happen. I believe it's coming. You say, I don't believe it. Well, just sit there and watch it. It'll roll right on by you. Passion and power are twins that are coming back together. We're seeing it in this ministry. And it's going to flow forth from this ministry into all of Tulsa. And there's going to be a change made. There's a family reunion coming. Number two, the second set of twins that needs to be reunited. Faith and fruit. What is faith? Well, the Bible tells us, Hebrews 11 verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. How important is faith in the lives of God's people? Hebrews eleven six. 6, you read on down five verses. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. So see, your hairdo without faith doesn't please God. No matter how dressed up you get, if you don't have faith, it doesn't please God. No matter how much money you put in the offering plate, if you're not doing it in faith, you're not pleasing to God. We need to get faith reunited with his twin brother and the twin brother of faith is fruit because when you've got enough faith, you'll start producing some fruit. That verse finishes up, but without faith it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Galatians 5 verse 22 and 23 says, but the fruit of the spirit, let's read that together. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. There's a lot of talk going on about wanting to inspect people's fruits. That goes on a lot on Facebook. I call it judging people. Christians love to judge other Christians. I'm going to tell you what, you have not been called to judge anybody. And as far as I can discern from this holy written word, you are not called to be a fruit inspector. People on Facebook say, well, I'm not judging them. I'm just inspecting their fruits. Well, you know what? Get the worms out of your apples before you start looking at other people's apples. We ought to be inspecting our own fruit. We ought to be mature enough in the spirit realm to realize that faith and fruit go together. The reason some people have no fruit, the reason some people have no love, no joy, no peace, no patience, no gentleness, no goodness, they have no faith. It's time to get faith back in the house of God, a faith that believes that God is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Because when you start getting yourself full of faith, the fruit will come. I'll tell you what, faith is the fertilizer that makes fruit grow on your limbs. I want to have all the fruit in the world, but you know what? There's a lot of people striving to have a lot of fruit, but they have no faith. I want to have faith that says, because of my faith, I'm going to show you my fruit. There's a family reunion happening right now in the body of Christ. There are a multitude of men and women and boys and girls who are rising up to their full stature and they're showing this lost world they are people of faith. Amen. People ask me, you want those faith preachers? I said, are there any other kind? Amen. What kind of preachers are there if they're not faith preachers? Some people in the church use that word faith like it's a dirty word. You're not part of that faith bunch, are you? Well, what are you part of, that doubt bunch? I mean, there's only two roads to go. Are we faith or are we in doubt? I'll tell you what, I want to have faith. And because of my faith, I'm going to love. Because of my faith, I'm going to have peace. Because of my faith, I'm going to have joy. Because of my faith, I'm going to have patience and goodness and meekness and temperance. Faith and fruits are twins. And they go hand in hand. And if you look at one, you'll recognize that it's related to the other. But that hadn't been taught in the church. That hadn't even really been brought up. 
We're told that we're supposed to possess fruit so that people will know that we are the children of God. I had a preacher tell me that a while back. The only way the world can recognize us is by the fruit that we produce. I said, that's not what the Bible says. Kind of offended him a little bit. I said, the Bible says the world would know we are disciples of Christ by the love that we have for one another. Let me tell you what, that's a whole other 25-minute sermon. You get to preach on love, it takes faith to love people. That's why love is a fruit of the Spirit. We need to get faith and the fruit of the Spirit hooked back up, and I believe it's coming. Number three, the third set of twins that needs to be reunited, vision and victory. Do you know what? There's a lot of God's people that have no vision. And I'm not talking about the natural. I'm not talking about wearing glasses or being blind in the natural. I'm talking about having a vision. Do you know the vision I believe God's people need to get, Patrick? We need to get a vision of who we really are through Christ Jesus. We are now the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. The Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are following after the Spirit and not after the flesh. I'll tell you what, we need to start seeing ourselves and having a vision of ourselves such as God does. When he looks at us, he sees that we are his children, that we are bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of talk about victory. There's a lot of people preaching about spiritual warfare and how they're going to overcome. I'm going to tell you how you're going to overcome. You're going to get a vision of who you are in the body of Christ by the blood of Christ. Then victory comes. Well, I'm a victor and not a victim. Let me tell you what, if you don't have a vision, you're going to be a victim the rest of your life. If you don't have a vision, you're going to go around with your head down saying, Whoa, it's me. I'm just an old worm in the dirt. I'm no good. Mom said I was just like Dad, and I guess I'm going to be just like Dad. Grandpa was a drunk, and his grandpa was a drunk, and I guess I'll just be a drunk. Nobody in my family ever graduated from college. Nobody ever had a new car. Nobody ever bought a new house. Baloney, rise up. Begin to see yourself as God sees you. Then the victory will come. Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keeps the law, happy is he. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our smarts. Oh, let me reread that. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our finances. No? Through who? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. There are two twins walking around in this city, and their names are Vision and Victory, and it's time that the church gets them back together. It's time that we say it's time for a family reunion. It's time that Vision and Victory walk in the back door of the church, hand in hand, sit down on a pew together, and start showing us what it really means to live the abundant life that Jesus came to provide. There's some of you in here this morning with low self-esteem. You don't think much of yourself. Let me tell you what, there'll never be victory if you live life like that. If you say, nobody likes me, I'm not worth anything, I'm the last rung on the ladder. No, you are the apple of God's eye. Get a vision for who you really are. You say, well, I've been addicted, I've been beat up, I've been in sin, I've been knocked down. Let me tell you what, whatever the world does to you, whatever the devil has done to you, whatever your family says about you does not matter because your value is not determined by someone else's opinion. Your value is determined by the fact that Jesus died on the cross for you. Get a vision. Well, you don't know how many sins I've committed. It doesn't matter. Get a vision that you are now cleansed. Your sins are gone, never to be remembered against you again. There is a value that God placed on the inside of you, and if you could look in the mirror and see that, you'd be a victor every day of your life. You would not start into a battle that you could not gain the victory over if you could really get a vision of who you are. You're valuable. I want you to say that. Say, I am valuable. God created me. And God don't create no junk. I am valuable. All the school teachers are cringing at my English this morning in this room, I know. But I'm telling you the truth, God don't make no junk. You're valuable. Your value is in the fact that God created you in his likeness and image. It doesn't matter what happens to you in life, that value is still there. You've got to get a vision of yourself as being valuable. Doesn't matter what people say. Doesn't matter how they treat you. Let let me show you something. See if she's left me any money in this wallet. 
Look at there. Did you know I had that? That's a hundred dollar bill. Now that's part of my car payment tomorrow, so you're not going to get it. <laughs> but if I was to hold that up and say, who wants that hundred dollar bill? Would anybody in here want it? Sure. Jodine done stepped on Art to get it. She'd come over the top of him. <laughs> Why? Because the government says that piece of paper right there is worth one hundred dollars. Right? right? What well, if we do that to it? Anybody still want it? Huh? What, 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 if we, what if we throw it on the floor and we walk on it? What if I mash it in the carpet? It's flat and it's crumpled. Anybody still want it? Why? Because it's worth $100. It doesn't matter where it's been. It doesn't matter what it's gone through. It doesn't matter how wrinkled it is or how stained it gets. That's a $100 bill. It's the same way with you. You might have some stains on you. You might have been walked on. You might have been crumpled. You say, yeah, but pastor, you have no idea how bad it's really been in my life. You've been torn in two, some of you in this room. You've been separated from your families. You've been hurt by the church. One piece of this is worth nothing without the other piece. I'm talking about twins this morning. I'm talking about getting vision and victory back together. If you get yourself back together with your creator, even though that $100 bill, and that's a real $100 bill, even though that $100 bill, you having a coronary up here? Let me show you something. I can lay that $100 bill. Come here, honey, and help me. <laughs> hold, that, hold that thing together right there. Okay. Got it. I'll pick it up. i put that piece so on that side and that piece. Put one on the back. Now, that $100 bill might not look as good as it did when I started. But I can take it to the bank and they'll give me a brand new, fresh, clean $100 bill for it. Why? Because the value is not in how it looks. The value is not in whether it's been stepped on or not. The value is not whether it's been torn in two or not. The value is placed in this piece of paper by the United States government and they got it backed up with gold and I can take it to any bank and get a brand new one. I want you to know something this morning. If you'll see yourself like God sees you, you'll know that your value is still there. God still loves you. God still cares. Get your vision back and you'll get your victory. Anybody goes to lunch with me today, I want to watch you see me spend this $100 bill. I could spend that on lunch and they'll take it even though it's been ripped in two. You say, Pastor, you're spending a long time on point number three. I'm trying to drive something into your minds and into your hearts. If you'll get vision hooked up with victory, there's not enough devils in hell to hold you back. There's not enough demons in hell to hold you down. You are wonderfully and fearfully and masterfully made in God's likeness and image. And it's time that your vision gets hooked back up with your victory. And when it does, there's nothing you can't do. Amen? Are you all right over there? All right. Number four, we're going to move through these next two real quick. Success and sacrifice. That's two twin brothers that have been separated by the world. Because the world says, if I'm going to be successful, then I don't want to have to sacrifice anything to get there. The world's mindset of success is step on everybody on your way up. That's not how it works in the body of Christ. In the body of Christ, if we want to succeed in ministry, in business, in teaching, in whatever it is, relationships, we must prefer our brother and prefer our sister. We must step back, put our own needs, wants, and desires on the back burner, become a living sacrifice for Jesus Christ, and then success comes. Then promotion comes. Success and sacrifice go hand in hand. Success and sacrifice are twin sisters. And it's time that we open the doors to the church and let them back in and start preaching that. There are empty churches all over this city today. Why? 
Because at one point they were successful, but they refused to sacrifice. There are people in this city who once had fortunes worth millions and some even billions of dollars, and they don't have them today. Why? Because they had success, but they refused to sacrifice. Joshua 1 verse 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. Do you know God doesn't have a problem with you having success? He wants you to be successful. You want a new Lincoln Town Car? You want a new Lexus? You want a new Mercedes? Do you know what? Start sacrificing your own will to God's will, and he'll take you to brand new levels you've never been on before. He'll get you a promotion at work. He'll put favor upon you that will make people want to be around you. I'm telling you what, if we would just get success and sacrifice linked together. Romans 12 verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Brothers and sisters, if we will present ourselves a living sacrifice, success will follow. You say, I've never had any success. I'm on my sixth marriage. I don't care if you're on your 60th marriage. I don't care if you've had more husbands than Liz Taylor. If you will sacrifice yourself, your own will and your own body to Jesus Christ. He can stop that vicious cycle right now and say from today forward, you'll have success in your relationships. You say, Brother Lacey, I've had 14 bankruptcies. It doesn't matter. If you will sacrifice your will and your finances to God and say, I'm going to trust you from here on out, from today forward, you'll have success in your finances. Sacrifice and success are twins. It's time we realize that. Number five, the fifth set of twins that need to be reunited. Repentance and revival. Right. How many of you heard, oh, I want to see a revival. We sing about it, we pray, oh, I believe revival's coming. Revival ain't coming until you start praying. Right. Oh, I believe a revival. It doesn't matter who you book at your church to preach. It doesn't matter what singing groups you come in until repentance gets back hand in hand with revival. Revival's not coming. That's right. yeah. It takes repentance. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. God said, if my people which are called by my name, who are those people? That's you. That's me and you, Benny. The rest of these people are lost, I guess, because me and you are the only two who got our hands up. You, okay. God's people. God said, if my people which are called by my name, what's God's name? God the Father is Jehovah. We know Jehovah's name. Do you know that blows the mind of all the Jehovah's Witnesses in this town? They can't believe there's a bunch of people up here on the hill in West Tulsa that know God's name. I know his name. He said, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Now listen to this. He's not talking to the lost world. He said, if the church would turn from their wicked ways. There's some wickedness going on in the church. In the church? Church people, most of them, or a great number of them, I'm thankful not in this church, but most churches I've ever been in, church people got the worst attitudes of anybody in the world. They're the most negative, they're the most hateful, they're the most rude, they're the most condescending. And they say, well, we, we don't have anything to repent of. <laughs> Church people say, well, I, I, I don't smoke and I don't drink. Well, do you gossip? Come on. You stick your nose in people's business when it doesn't belong there? Because right. I don't see anything Jesus said about smoking. But he had a whole lot to say about not minding your own business. So if we want revival and we're going to try to advocate for revival and we're going to tell people revival's coming, we're going to have to find out what the recipe for revival is and we're going to have to find out who revival's long lost twin brother is and we're going to have to search him down. Brother Chumley, we're going to have to get on Ancestry.com and we're going to have to put the name revival in there and you know what's going to happen? We're going to trace back and maybe not one generation and maybe not two and maybe not three but way over there in Scotland somewhere in 18. 1864, we'll find that revival came when he hooked up with repentance and we'll bring it back to the church today. Revival and repentance go hand in hand. What does repentance mean? Well, God said if we turn from our wicked ways, he would hear from heaven, forgive our sins, and heal our lands. That sounds like revival to me. Do you know what repentance means? Turning around. Turning around. If you're on a highway and you miss your exit, you've got to take the next exit ramp, don't you? You get off that exit and you go down and you go back over the overpass and you take the on-ramp. Do you know what I believe the church needs to do in the year 2016? 
We need to take the exit ramp of confession. We need to tell the world we're not as perfect as we pretend to be. We really don't have it all figured out, and we don't have all the answers. We're just as messed up as you are, but we've accepted Christ as our Savior, and we want you to get in here and help us do something for the kingdom of God. If we take that exit ramp of confession, you know what we'd find once we got off on that exit ramp called confession? We'd find an overpass called grace. And let me tell you what, when you exit there at confession and you cross on the overpass of grace, when you get ready to make that left back on the highway going the right way, you're going to see an on-ramp that says this is restoration on-ramp and restoration will usher in revival and it's time that America has revival. Amen. But it's up to the church. The lost world's not going to bring revival. Revival's not about bringing a bunch of lost people in this building. What does revival mean? Bringing back something to life that is dead. Amen. And for the most part, a big portion of the body of Christ is dead and has been for a long time. You know how I can tell? Because people show up at church and they sing the same three songs and they listen to the same old message that's drier than last year's turkey nest. Amen. Nobody's getting saved. Nobody's getting healed. Nobody's getting fed. Nothing big is happening and they go out the same way they came in. I talked to a pastor a few weeks ago, and you know what he told me about his church? He said, I'm a hospice pastor. I said, you're a what? He said, I'm a hospice pastor. He said, I'm just staying there until the last one's dead, then we'll shut it down. I said, somebody ought to take a set of horse reins and whoop you out in the middle of the street and get a new preacher in there that's got a vision for what God can do in America. I'm telling you what, revival is coming, but it's only coming when we hook him back up with his twin brother called repentance. And you know what I did? Last night, after God gave me this message, my wife was in bed, the kids were in bed, I went into my prayer closet and I shut the door and I began to repent. Lord, forgive me for my wrong attitude. Forgive me for the things that I say that I know I ought not say. Forgive me for not being as loving as I could be. Forgive me for not helping as much as I could help. I repented in there, and I came into this place today, Brother Keith, with a clean conscience and a made-up mind that I'm going to see revival come through New Covenant Bible Church that's going to spread to all of Tulsa. The only way it's going to happen, though, is if God's people will humble ourselves, turn from our wicked ways, and ask Him to heal our land. God, bless America again, but we're going to bless you first. Let's pray together.